right. Today I'm joined by Dr. Tim Ireland, who is the owner and medical director at Newtontown Veterinary Hospital in Pennsylvania. He's been an, o an owner for over 30 years and is a recent board member of the canine support teams and locally involved in the track and field as an assistant coach in his community. Uh, Dr. Ireland, thank you so much for joining me. This has been a, a podcast that's been a, a hell of a time trying to get it to be recorded. So thank you for, for being here. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah. So one of the, the big things we got connected through the Veterinary Financial um, Summit. So with Meredith Jones and her work there um, and then being connected on LinkedIn, one of the big things that kind of caught my attention was some of the commentary you had around corporate medicine. And I would love to kind of start there. I know it's a big topic, but you know, you've been an owner for over 30 years. What have you seen from corporate? What are your thoughts? Um, I know you have a handful of them, so I'd love to, to kind of jump in there and we'll We'll, we'll go from from there from our for our conversation today. Yeah, no, that that's I've uh, been rather opinionated, not a huge fan. Yeah. Uh, when I guess when the first practice in my area went corporate uh, was a very long time ago, and I was actually uh, excited about the idea that I thought that uh, you know corporations being able to consolidate the things that can be consolidated. And, you know, and having some control over standard of care um, that they might be able to offer, you know, excellent quality care, even more cost effectively um, because they could consolidate HR and, uh, you know, have better buying power. And what I found in my area is that they come in, they don't do anything with standard of care. They raise the prices um, and they don't pay people any better and they maximize profit. And I, I think that that has gotten even worse with the venture capitalists coming in and, because they want their money back quickly. And so, you know, if you have somebody that's investing in a business for three to five years or five to seven years um, and looking to roll up to the next biggest consolidator, then the focus truly is just on profit um, and the people and quality and, and unfortunately the pets. Um, are no longer the priority. Yeah, you you made a comment that that was really pointed, but excellent that you said that the lack of the investment in the people is is pretty telling that it's kind of all bark no bite. But if you go on, and we talked about like LinkedIn, right? You're on LinkedIn. That's how we got connected. I mean, you look at the posts, you look at what they talk about, right? It's all about the people. It's all about you know how wonderful their platform is for their doctors and how much they care and what they're investing into their people. And you would say, yeah, I don't believe that. Well, I guess I'm waiting to see, you know, that sure. one, one of my frustrations as a practice owner who has put his people first is, you know, they have the money to to flood the airwaves. And, and so they're flooding the airwaves with the message that uh, young veterinarians want to hear about mentorship and people first and all of this. But they have you know, multiple decades of doing everything but that. Um, and I'm putting out the same message, but it's the message I've been putting out for three decades. Um, and so, you know, I mean, if there's, if there's any entity that can flip the switch and put people first, you know, it's the corporate practices, you know, that they've done the research and they have the, the resources, but I'll, I guess I'll believe it when I see it. What do you think the expectations of are of new grads? And as you've tried to go out and have those conversations, as you're trying to, you know, like a lot of other private practices, grow, attract talent, do all that. What do those conversations look like? Right. I mean, I think the, the biggest thing that, that so many of them are looking for is the mentorship. Um, and, yeah. Like we didn't really talk, we didn't really use the word mentorship. I don't think when I was in school, but uh, you know, when we were getting out of school, you knew the practices, uh, at least the ones in the local area where you were going to be left alone, um, and uh, and you knew the practices where where you would have support, and if you really, you know, were somebody that wanted the hands-on and and intensive mentorship. Um, you did an academic internship, and 
the non-academic internships were were pretty new at that time, um, and and those were for the people that wanted to get a ton of experience in a really short amount of time, um, and you know, and they could jump into practice uh, kind of head and shoulders above the crowd uh, after after that. And uh, I don't think anymore that internship outside of uh, a teaching hospital um, means mentorship means mentorship at all. Yeah, that that's not been what I'm seeing. Can you touch on that? Because I I had noted that you talked about you know kind of internships versus mentorship and just how quickly that someone that thinks they're getting mentorship it's actually just like hey this is a this is a position we're paying you and we want you to to be working and we're not really there to kind of invest in you is that what you've seen or do you have any analogies or stories or uh, comments on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's going to be some degree of that in private practices and in corporate practices. But I think in in corporate practices that are paying new grads what they're offering, I think you got to ask, you know, what are they expecting in return? Um, you know, what kind of hours are they going to have to work and and that kind of thing. But uh, you know, the thought that internship equals mentorship just isn't true in in the corporate practice setting, 75% of the specialty hospitals in the U.S. are now corporate owned. And I have two uh, associates that work for me that were both alone in the hospital overnight um, within their first two weeks on the job. Um, and one of those was on her second shift. Um, she was alone overnight and she had a phone number she could call if she got into trouble. but. Yeah, yeah, I was pretty much told, don't call me. <laughs> um, yeah. And, you know, and so we wonder why why they're burning out and, uh, you know, why so many young people are, are looking for alternatives to, to clinical practice. Um, and, you know, she came to me on the verge of leaving the profession a year out of school. Um, and uh, And so I think we need to do better. And when you say that we need to do better, I hear that a lot. What, you know, you can wave your magic wand, right? You, you're able to structure how private practice, corporate, all these different things operate. What would you try to instill or, or build out there to, to do better for these, these young new grads coming out that want mentorship, that want to be able to grow, that want to become fantastic doctors? Right. And I think mentorship is is different for everybody that uh, like my mentor. I knew was always available um, and, you know, he wasn't hovering. Uh, I actually my very first day in surgery, uh, I, I walked into the practice and he said, yeah, you know how to do an enucleation? And I said, yeah, I learned about it in school. And you know, he says, have you done one? I said, no. He said, so tell me what you would do. And I kind of went through what I remembered from, from class. And he said, sounds good. I'll be upstairs if you need me. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but, and he was, uh, you know, a yell away. And he did come back to check on me a couple of times. But, um, you know, I, I knew he was there. Um, that I think today um, the students are coming out you know, looking for a little bit more hands-on than that. Some of them are looking for a lot more hands-on than that. Um, but there has to be a discussion, you know, that it can't just be, oh, that you offer mentorship. That's great. I want to work for you. Um, you know, what does mentorship look like at your practice? Yeah. You know, and and have a, some idea of what you want it to look like. Um, that mentorship at my practice, yeah. I actually reduce my surgery schedule and schedule with a new associate um, so that uh, I can scrub in with them. They can scrub in with me. Um, you know, when they get to a point where they want to try something new that they haven't done, uh, I'm available for them. Um, and, uh, you know, we meet every week. It's on, it's in the schedule uh, that we're going to sit down and go over cases. And, you know, I'm fortunate to have a, a crew of associates that will answer questions on the fly. And so, uh, you know, my new uh, new graduates don't need to wait for our meeting to ask their questions. But, um, 
you know, they know that they're going to have one-on-one time with me uh, where we can kind of dig into things. And when they get to a point where they don't have specific cases that they've seen in the past week, then we pick a topic and, and dig in and, you know, and, and just try to keep that educational process moving forward. Yeah, I love that. And I know we kind of jumped into big, heavy questions, but just going through your ownership journey and experience, and can you kind of lay out what the team looks like today and kind of what it, where your journey has led you from, from an ownership perspective? Yeah, sure. That um, I got out of school. Yeah. If I wasn't the highest debt in my class, I was really close to the highest debt in my class. Um, and, yeah, you know, had, hopes of being an orthopedic surgeon and didn't match on an internship and uh, landed in Newtown with a guy that I just, you know, really gelled with and, you know, knew coming out of school that I needed to be an owner if I was going to be able to pay my student loans, you know, that I had, uh, you know, a, a, I guess, a guaranteed monthly income of $2,500 before taxes. Um, and my, my initial student loan payments were 17 something a month. And, and so, you know, I consolidated and if I hadn't rolled them into my mortgage, I would be finishing my student loans this year, 2023. Um, but I kind of came out with the mentality that I had to be an owner because I didn't have enough money. Yeah. And uh, which today it seems to be the opposite that, you know, I have too much debt, so I can't be an owner um, to me really uh, is counterintuitive. But, um, you know, I, I was given an opportunity to buy my practice. I was, uh, you know, two and a half years out of school, um, bought the practice, was basically a one and a half doctor practice. Um, we grew it to two pretty quickly um, and then to three. And, and. Uh, I guess I hired my fourth uh, full-time associate. Um, I was probably owner of like uh, maybe the sixth year. Um, and so we grew really quickly. Um, never wanted it to be, you know, Tim Ireland's vet hospital and uh, that it's the Newtown Veterinary Hospital. Um, had um, a guy coming out of an internship, uh, you know, very early on. Um, that I tried to hire. And, and the reason he didn't take the job with me was that he thought I was too young and didn't believe me when I said that I would, uh, you know, let him, uh, let him buy into the practice. And so, he, you know, took a job with an older vet because uh, he saw uh, ownership being a, a possibility sooner. And so, you know, I, I just really uh, haven't had associates that were interested in own in the hospital um, and uh, not for lack of trying, but um, it just has, hasn't been there. And, it, you know, that there was a time we had four, four full-time doctors that all lived in the zip code that the practice is in. Um, and now I think uh, I have seven associates. Um, the, the shortest commute uh, is about 30 minutes, I think. Um, and so, you know, we have doctors now that, uh, you know, work hard when they're at work and when they're not at work, they, uh, you know, want to, want to be away from it. Um, you know, I was thrilled to death the first time I was recognized in the grocery store, you know, <laughs> um, and, and didn't remember the client's name, but fortunately I remembered the dog's name. So that was yeah. you know, probably more important. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, you know, I think there's been a transition and, and I've grown to a size where, um, you know, one person can't come in and buy me, you know, that, that the practice generates $4 million a year and, uh, you know, the corporates, uh, I get to offer literally almost every day. Um, and I would really like to avoid that. And so, you know, I'm looking for somebody that, uh, you know, that wants to be an owner and is actually looking for, for that type of mentorship uh, that I have mentored uh, medical directors. Um, and, uh, you know, I probably have uh, at least four associates uh, that work for me that now own their own practice um, that, uh, you know, didn't want something the size of mine, but, uh, you know, but wanted to be an owner. 
And do you have, I mean, from those conversations, do you feel like there's a, an underlying theme for why it's been a challenge? Because, I mean, you've grown and you don't want to sell the corporate, which is different from a lot of your peers, but you don't have someone from a private perspective that's either worked there or seen it that wanted to, to acquire it. Or has there been any attempts that just didn't work for a variety of reasons after you got farther down the road? Right. I had I had one. Yeah. One near miss, I guess. Sure. <laughs> that, yeah. that, you know, it was somebody that um, that I connected with when I was uh, on the um, involved with the PVMA. Um, actually, uh, was her the state VMA uh, matched me with her when she was a student, um, and uh, and so I kind of mentored her uh, for a long time and brought her in as medical director and and I thought future partner. Um, and, you know, she commuted from an hour away for four years. And, and I the week after she accepted medical director position, she found out she was pregnant. Um, and, and which was was not planned, but certainly welcomed um, by all parties. And, and and so when her daughter was ready to start preschool, um, she knew she couldn't be an hour away. And uh, and so you know, it was a, a family decision on her part, you know, do we move closer to the hospital so that work and, and school are, uh, you know, nearby? Um, or or do we look for, uh, you know, another opportunity? And, and her husband, who had a five-minute commute, um, was not willing to give up his commute. Um, and, and so she resigned. And she owns a fabulous hospital now. Uh, that she she built from scratch uh, closer to home, yeah. which is I mean I think you kind of described it as like a, almost like a coaching tree, right? They have these famous uh, coaches, and then they have you know coaches that then go on and build great teams and have some great success. Um, it is it is cool that you can look at that and and have you know fond memories and thoughts of, of being able to help get someone ready for that. If you can improve the health of an animal, you do it right. Of course, that's what makes veterinarians special. You're mission driven. My friends at LifeLearn are the exact same way. For over 25 years, they've been partnering with you and your peers, providing affordable, customizable online software solutions. These solutions save time, increase efficiency, and assist in managing all aspects of operations. Why? They wanna help you improve your partnership with pet owners to improve pet health. LifeLearn has award-winning digital media solutions and are leading the pack as they've prioritized having extensive veterinary knowledge throughout their teams. That difference is seen, it's heard, and it's read by thousands of people across the country. Relax, grow, and thrive with LifeLearn. Click the link in the show notes for an exclusive offer to see how LifeLearn can allow you to get back to what you do best. For someone listening that wants to become a practice owner, right, that's location agnostic, I mean, do they, they're like, hey, Tim, that sounds great. Like, how, how do we do it? Like, are you open if someone wanted to reach out and say, I want to have a conversation? I want to keep it private. Like, how do I, you know, start the process of buying the hospital? I want to, you know, make that clear if that's the intent, right? Because, yeah, there's going to be some day where, you know, the 150th offer from corporate comes in and you're like, what do I do? I don't want to shut the doors, right? You want to serve the community. Um, you have to do something. But yeah. how do you how do you how do you wrestle with that? Because I think that'd be extremely difficult. Yeah, that that's I mean, I, I certainly have had conversations, you know, with people that were not in my area, you know, and and encourage them and and kind of mentor them from afar. And, I'm, uh, you know, I'm happy to do that. But I think um, that there's. There may be a misconception from an owner's perspective that like. I got to sell the whole practice all at once, and uh, and so have to sell a corporate because nobody can afford it. But you know, if you have uh, you know a young associate that's interested in ownership and interested in investing in the hospital and wants equity and and wants to grow the the, the hospital, then you know you sell them a piece of it, whatever they can afford to buy, and the the remainder of the hospital is still yours and anything that they do to grow their shares is going to grow your shares and you know it ends up being a win-win 
well, it may be a win-win-win if your goal is to keep it out of corporate hands. Um, and uh, and so, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd be happy to, uh, to talk to somebody that I'm currently medical director and I have stepped aside before um, so that other people could get that experience. Um, and right now, you know, my associates uh, work really hard, but, uh, you know, want uh, don't want the, the management side of it. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, I would love to just mentor my young, uh, young vets and, uh, you know, have somebody else keep an eye on protocols and keep an eye on, on staff training and the things that, that a medical director can do um, to help grow the hospital. Yep. No, I think it's well put and, and I would agree. It doesn't have to be an all or nothing. And even just from a dollars and cents perspective, uh, one big check is going to get taxed a little bit differently than, than you know, a handful of smaller installment sales. Right. If you can find the right person and, and be able to transition it out over time, and maybe it's more than one person, right, for, for your case, but for others, it might be one person that wants to own it all, but they need to take, you know, bites of it, right? Like mm -hmm. the, the old analogy, right? How do you eat an elephant? It's like one bite at a time, right? So mm -hmm. if the, the practice purchase price, and there's agreement on, on ownership in that new buyer on wanting to do that, it's, it's how do you structure that and, and go through where everyone is properly incentivized, everyone has clear expectations. I think that's always the tricky part, right? It's easy to talk about, hard to structure, yep. hard to structure. It's easy to, to share in a podcast. It's hard, I think, to do in, in, in practicality, but I think it can be a really uh, powerful thing if that is the, the ultimate goal, which um, you know, I, as one that's been a pro-private practice person for a long time, appreciate that when, when someone in your shoes, like you, um, has the ability to see, you know, beyond life changing money if they wanted it tomorrow, but they've said, this is something that is important to me and I want to try to find a solution, but, you know, um, continuing to, to tell that story and talk about it. So for that, I, I appreciate that. And I think a lot of people probably, um, do as well. Yeah. No, and it's definitely, you know, you're talking about a partnership. You want it to be a long time uh, deal. And uh, it's got to be the right fit, you know, totally. and I think um, I, I would like to think that it's a great opportunity for somebody, you know, to buy in as a minority partner. Um, you know, I guess there would be a lot of people that would hesitate, you know, to, to make an investment uh, without necessarily having the all the control of the owner if you're a minority partner. but. Uh, I'm a pretty democratic leader and I'm incapable of making decisions without considering how they're going to impact the people around me. And, um, and, uh, and so, you know, I think, I think it's a great opportunity. You know, when I bought my practice um, in order to keep the, the expenses down, you know, my mentor and I um, said that we would, and, you know, have one person do the appraisal and that we would uh, hire one attorney to write the agreement. And, uh, you know, we had to sign all kinds of uh, legal paperwork um, because uh, nobody wanted to do it that way. Um, sure. And, uh, you know, at the end of our settlement uh, where, you know, he went through each clause and said, you know, if I was advising the seller, I would tell you this if i was advising the buyer i would tell you this and fred and i would look at each other and you know say whether it was important to us or not and and you know and make a decision and if there were things that were important to him and there were things that were important to me and and at the end the the lawyer got up and he said i gotta tell you like it's not even lunchtime i blocked off the whole day for this <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, I would like to think that I would uh, I would pass that on uh, to somebody that was interested in in continue, you know, it's community service. We've been in Newtown um since 1936. Uh, you know, and the owner has lived in the zip code that the practice is in since 1936. Um that I uh, would really like to keep it a you know, community service. That's what I think sure. that medicine is. Yeah. You mentioned it earlier, and I tend to agree with you on the, hey, I have too many student loans, I can't be an owner, which it seems bass backwards, right? Like the, the easiest way to pay off more debt is to increase your income. How do I increase my income? It would be 
by having equity in a practice. And I know that's an oversimplification. There's lots of other hurdles. So don't people listening yell at me too much um, mm-hmm. you know, in their car or at home. I get that it's oversimplification, but you can distill it down to those key tenants in that, that kind of structure. So why do you think student loans are, are the excuse? Or do you think it's just at school, they're told that private practice is dead. There's no opportunities. I mean, have you heard feedback from, from folks? Like what, what do you, why do you think that that is the, the prevailing thought process of a lot of new grads? Right. I, uh, it's scary as shit that, uh, you know, and I, I think it, it's really, um, facing your fears and, 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 uh, you know, so much in veterinary medicine and and in life, you're you know you're way in the it's uh, your know, risk benefit analysis and you know how much risk are you willing to take? Uh, that I mean, when I bought my practice, I was single and had no dependents, and so uh, you know I was able to to work eighty hours and and build the practice so I could hire people so that we didn't have to work like that. And that if I was married with kids, I, I couldn't have made that commitment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I either wouldn't have bought the practice or it would have grown a lot slower. Um, and so, you know, I think there, there's a, always a balancing act going on. Um, but I think the biggest thing is, is just the fear. You know, you come out of school with, you know, a mortgage, you know, $250,000, $300,000 in debt. Um, you know, the idea of adding a zero to that, yeah. Is scary yeah, that uh, you know. I I grew up in a blue collar family that I remember joking uh, with uh, with my family, asking you know to be a millionaire, do you have to have a million dollars or just owe a million dollars? Well, in in the millionaire thing, um, there's a really good quote from Morgan Housel, who's kind of a he's a financial writer and he's very gifted, excellent, excellent at what he does. He talks about most people want to that they say they want to be a millionaire actually want to spend a million dollars. They don't want to be a millionaire, right? Because the habits and the things that it would have, take to do that are not the same as spending a million dollars. Mm-hmm. Because everyone wants to spend a million dollars, right? <laughs> they just don't want to, they don't want to live like a lot of, you know, millionaires do because it's very different. Those are very different things. But yeah, <laughs> if I owe a million dollars, how does that work? Right. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned a little bit on, you know, student loans, we talked a little about that. We talked about ownership, um, the opportunity that's there. Other advice that you would give to veterans that are either in school, coming out of school, younger in their career, just in general, of what they should be thinking about, what they should consider. Um, I guess just really open ended. Yeah, and I, I guess I, some of that I would would uh, throw on them. I think. Um, Veterinary medicine right now is is in crisis. You know that there's I don't, last time I looked, fourteen thousand associate vet postings on Indeed or something like that. Um, and so the graduates coming out of school not only have opportunity to to get paid more than legitimately they're they're worth to the practice, and you know their practices have to. Uh, you know, bite the bullet and and make the investment uh, because they're going to get it from somebody else. Uh, and so, they have an opportunity to uh, to practice the way that they want to practice. And so, you know, I would say for any associate out there that's unhappy, um, you know, whether it's somebody getting ready to graduate, looking for their first job, somebody, you know, finishing an internship that wasn't quite what they thought it should be. Um, or, you know, an associate that's been out 10 years and just, uh, you know, in a rut, you have opportunity to to have the job you always dreamed of. And so have some idea of what that looks like, uh, you know, that uh, is, is it about uh, compensation? Is it about the type of clients that uh, you'll be taken care of? Is it about, uh, you know, your work schedule? Um, and uh, you know, I think everybody talks about yeah, work-life balance. That to me, it's it's just balance. Yeah, you know that that's I had. Yeah, 
I guess, five and a half hours I was up uh, before the podcast. And, uh, you know, I turned over half of my garden and uh, did a lot of things that people would consider work. Um, but that's, you know, it's my therapy, getting my hands in the dirt and cleaning out the cow shed. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, you have to have enough things in your life that, that bring you joy and keep you grounded and work can do that. And to think about, uh, you know, what things in a job would, uh, would bring you joy and, uh, and be willing to, to put that into words for an employer uh, so that they know if they can offer you that or not. Yeah. Say, so when you say that veterinary medicine isn't a crisis, you, it's a crisis because it's so hard to find veterinarians. It's a crisis because of mental health. It's a crisis because student loan debt, or is it just yes to all those things? Or when you say crisis, I guess, unpack what you think the, the crisis is there. Yeah, and it, it's it's all the above that, uh, you know, anybody that's followed me, uh, you know, I keep saying it's a universal problem and it requires a, a universal response. And so, uh, you know, the, in order to fix uh, veterinary medicine, I think we need, you know, the educational institutions, uh, both veterinary and, and vet tech. We need um, uh, state boards that, uh, you know, I happen to be in a state where uh, we license technicians, but there's no uh, title protection. There's no uh, definition of scope of practice. And so there's not anything that they can do in my hospital that requires them to have a license. Um, and so, you know, I think the state boards need to be involved. I think um, that the insurance companies have to be involved. Uh, you know, the prices have gotten so high that access to care is a concern. Um, and, uh, you know, the one thing that came out of COVID and, uh, you know, the private equity invasion is everybody's prices went up, you know, and so staff is, is making more money. But every time I raise my prices, there's somebody that can't come in. And so that's where, you know, the shelters have to get involved. The municipalities have to get involved. So you're looking at, you know, local government, state government, federal government, because um, if if people can't access basic preventive care, then we have, you know, outbreak of zoonotic disease that's going to start in the communities that are already underserved on the medical side. And so um, it's really, um, it's a big problem. You know, the mental health aspect certainly is big. Um, and I think that, you know, we've taken strides in the right direction for that um, with uh, work schedules and and other things, but we still have, you know, corporate owned ER where economic euthanasia is happening every day. Yeah. And, you know, I think that yeah, young vets need to understand that it's, it's not that way everywhere. Um, that when the owner is in the next room and you can tell them, you know, I got a yeah, nine month old dog that yeah, has a pyometra on her first heat and the owner can't afford it. Uh, you know, what do I do that uh, that there needs to be alternatives that are other than, you know, at especially hospital five thousand dollar surgery or euthanasia. Um, and so I think a lot of young vets that have have been through like emergency internships think that there there is no middle ground. And so there's people working on, uh, you know, trying to put that message out there. And uh, I think Kate is talking it. Uh, calling it spectrum of care, um, that I always just called it practicing veterinary medicine. You, know, you offer gold standard care, and if the people can't afford it, then you figure out what to do. Um, that corporate practices, there's nobody available to ask that question, and so you're kind of forced into a corner um, where you can't uh, can't always offer alternatives. I'm going to simplify and I want to, I wonder if you would agree with me, but to me, a lot of those points stem back to financial or money in general. Do you think that's accurate or no? That, I mean, I think that 
that money plays a role, but no, I don't. I think part of the reason that veterinary medicine is in the crisis that we're in is practice owners, whether corporate or independent, have always taken advantage of the type of person that's drawn to veterinary medicine. And so, you know, nobody goes into veterinary medicine to make a lot of money. We go into it because we care. And we don't want to leave a job that we're unhappy at because we care about our patients or we care about our team. Um, and so, you know, I think uh, until we start to stand up for ourselves and say, uh, you know, our employer needs to do better and be willing to walk away, um, things are going to change slowly. Uh, but I, I think it's more the model of how we offer care um, that you know, yes, we need to pay better, um, but I think that you get away with paying less if it's an awesome job. Yeah. And so, you know, I think it's been for a long time a really hard job and not great pay. Um, and so I don't know that, it, that it's just financial. I think that there needs to be a, a cultural shift um, as well. Yeah, the reason, the reason I talked about the, you know, if I, if I boil it down to money is, if the education cost is so much higher, the cost of practicing has gotten so much higher, right? Just what the inputs are from from a COGS perspective. Then if I'm a younger veterinarian, just the, the practice valuations are so much higher because you're getting pushed by by others. Like there's a there's this compounding effect where even life just to pay for food and energy and housing and all those other things are higher. It seems like that is also what's forcing the cost of care to go up to a certain extent, right? Is because of the idea of, you know, what I call, you know, inflation is an insidious thing. And so inflation has kind of gone through and, and pushed all these things up to a point where it is absolutely pushing people out of the spectrum there. But I don't necessarily know if that's a, a veterinary and specific thing, right? Like that is a, that is almost an economic thing. That's almost a, a monetary thing, which I'm not trying to turn the conversation into that, but that's the way that, that my mind looks at it is sure. There are things that within veterinary medicine that can be worked on. Like you talked about the way, that the um, you know care is provided, the options given, um, corporate versus private, like all those things matter. But it's like I think it's almost up a level higher than some of that. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't know. It's we don't have to necessarily dig in to like agree or disagree. But I just I'm hearing you. And I'm like, man, so many of those things all kind of flow back. It's like further upstream. How do we go further upstream to those things? And I, I wonder if, if that's. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to think about that a little bit more. But that's kind of where my mind went initially. Right. Hmm. Yeah, that I certainly don't know the answer. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm here. I'm here, like thinking about it as we're going through. I'm like, hmm, that that's where my mind goes, and that's where I feel like I've identified just in a handful of things that you just articulated where those stem from. And um, yeah, uh, we'll see. Maybe uh, maybe someone listening will have the answers, but I don't know if we do at the moment. <laughs> Um, but it, it even goes back. One of the other things you talked about too, was that, you know, a lot of veterinarians right now wouldn't encourage someone younger that they care about to go into vet med. And that's, to me, is extremely sad, extremely sad, right? Like you talked about it. You were, you know, just blown away, humbled, excited, thrilled to be recognized in your local community as, you know, the veterinarian, right? Right. And, and for so many people now, they're like, yeah, you don't, you don't even want it, this career at all. And just that, that shift and that change is, is sad to see. Right. And I guess the, the, my message to that is because you hate your job doesn't mean you picked the wrong career. Um, and, and like, I just, I can't imagine anybody that has made the investment to get all the way through vet school, um, financial, personal, uh, you know, investment in every sense of the word. Um, to think that they they made a bad choice eh, is really sad. Um, that eh, proud to say, my daughter's eh, her first year vet student, and she was working in a corporate owned specialty hospital um, while she was applying. And every single intern, resident, attending that found out she was applying to vet school tried to talk her out of it, hundred percent. Mm. Not a single one uh, supported her. 
like I've lost count of the number of people that have come through my hospital that have gone on to vet school. Yeah, that uh, and it's a fabulous profession. You just need to be to land in the right spot. You know that I think if yeah, you know, take a look at the things that you're most unhappy with. Um, veterinary medicine, that degree opens so many doors. Yeah, you know that that don't think that going to vet school was ever a mistake. Yeah, you know, you followed your heart, um, and uh, and you were smart enough to to have the opportunity to do that. Um, that if you're unhappy, it's not because you're a veterinarian; it's because you not, haven't found the right job yet. All that. What haven't I asked about that you think is really important that you'd want to share, or that's on your heart or mind? Boy, I don't know. We've been uh, kind of across the board. <laughs> I know that's my style. We'll bounce around. <laughs> that, that uh, no, I and mean, I think I I love being a veterinarian. I love being the owner. You know, it's given me opportunities. Um, you know, there definitely have been headaches uh, and some nightmares. Um, COVID was one, and you know, in the beginning, asking my my people that I care about to risk their lives so that I could keep my hospital open, and because I was being told I should keep my hospital open, um, was was brutal. And, and you know, right now, the most stressful thing that I face is I I never dreamed would be an issue in veterinary medicine, and that's gone to work every day, knowing I'm going to have to say no to somebody. Um, and, and, you know, and that's where I think the model needs to change. Um, we don't have enough skilled professionals, vets and licensed techs, um, to, to meet the current need. And so we need to figure out ways to be more efficient, um, so that we can, uh, turn fewer people away and yeah. that that's brutal. Nobody wants to do that. So for every guest that comes on the show, I always let them ask me a question and it can be something serious. It can be something about our conversation. It can be something totally out of the, out of the blue or out of left field. Is there any question or anything that you want to know or a question you'd like to pose back to me? Uh, when's the last time you shaved your beard? Ooh, so this has come up a couple times, not quite phrased that way, but <laughs> so I would, the last time I was clean shaven would have been pre-Christmas of 2019. So not that long ago. Yeah. So it's been, it's basically coincides with, um, no, 2018. Sorry. Yeah. It would have been 2018. I'd, I'd change that. Yeah. 2018. Cause it, my, it was around with my son, but he was born in 2019. So that wouldn't have worked. He was born in the summer. So yeah, 2018. So yeah, end of the year, 2018. And the reason that I've kept it and the reason that I started growing it out was, I had forgotten all my stuff at home when I was up at my in-laws. I was like, shoot, it's kind of grown out a little bit more than what I would normally keep it. Um, if we find out that we're having a boy, I'll grow out a beard. And so when we found out we were having our son, I was like, I'm just going to keep it. And so now it's, I mean, it's on the podcast artwork. It's on mm -hmm. all kinds of things. But it will. there will come a day where I'll just show up all of a sudden to a podcast or an event or something, and it'll just be gone. And mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a couple triggers that will, will cause that, but I'm, I'm holding that those cards close to the vest as far as when that is. So, um, yeah, that's, that's the story on that. So my, my beard is to my eldest son really is why I have it. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to wrap up our wide ranging, but I think really interesting conversation that I, I don't know if I've had, had one that makes, cause I'm still going back to what you talked about earlier. Me thinking about that. Like I can't get that out of my mind now. Mm -hmm. Um, for, for a a for there are people that list this podcast that I I know want to own practices that are entrepreneurial that want things. Where would you send them? How do they reach out to you to connect? If they're like, hey, I want to talk to to Dr. Ireland. I might be interested in either finding a way to work for him, or finding a way to to talk about an acquisition, or buying in, or becoming a partner, or any of that stuff. Where would you send them? Is it LinkedIn? Is there an email? Is there a website? Um, how, how can people connect with you outside of the podcast? Yeah, I mean, the um, vet hospitals, newtownvet.com, if they want to you know, find out more about the practice, um, it needs to be updated, but it's there. Um, but LinkedIn is the easy way. I don't check it every day, but, yeah, but uh, 
I am good at getting back to people that way and, and uh, you know, happy to have a conversation uh, with anybody that, uh, you know, the last one that I, uh, last person I talked to was a husband and wife that, uh, you know, wanted to open their own practice and uh, just wanted to pick my brain about it. Yeah. Sure. So, yeah. Love that. Thank, thank, thank you for what you've done from a, the standpoint of being intentional with how you work with other veterinarians to, to help set them up for what they're trying to find. And you know, my, my hope is at some point down the road, maybe I'll see an announcement that, that you found, you know, kind of the, the next owner uh, of the yeah. clinic that can, can perpetuate some of the cool stuff going on because that stat of you know, 1936, right. Yeah. Having the same, having an owner of the hospital live in the zip code there, that's pretty special. And that's, that's something that's really unique that I think for the right person is meaningful. And as someone that grew up in a small town and for someone that kind of is a sucker for nostalgia and stuff like that, I love it. So I hope that, you know, you can have some good fruitful conversations in the near future. And then my last, you know, uh, piece of advice, not even advice, but just, I don't think anyone should feel guilty if there's no other way other than corporate. But I think having the mindset that I really want to, this is what my dream and goal is, is to find someone to find it. Um, I love that. And I want to support it. So thank you for the time. Thank you for coming on and yeah. um, appreciate it. And I'm glad we were able to get this done, even with all our technical challenges and stuff before right. I hit record. So thanks for sticking with me. Yeah, thank you. Recruiting team members in your veterinary practice has never been this hard. You can either bury your head in the sand and hope it goes away or adapt. Enter Guardian Vets. By leveraging best-in-class technology, you can empower your staff and reduce their workload. Help reduce burnout. You also provide a better experience for your clients and patients, which you want to do as you serve them. The solutions Guardian Vets offers includes after-hours triage, virtual CSRs, that know your team and processes, telemedicine, and so much more. Become the employer of choice in your area by offering the best tools to position your team for success. Whether you're starting a de novo clinic, multi-doctor, or multi-location, Guardian Vets can help you be more efficient and effective. Go to the website, guardianvets.com, click the Get Started button, then let them know that I sent you, right? Let them know the Vet Success Podcast sent you. Get 50% off your first month. Don't let another quarter or year happen before you start making changes because you know you need to. So talk to the Guardian Vets team today and implement a new solution. Have you ever walked into a space and thought, wow, this place is beautiful. There's a reason for that. Architecture has this innate ability to impact emotions and perceptions. My friends at Apex Design Build bring beautiful and functional spaces for veterinarians nationwide. Apex is a fourth generation family run company that is fully integrated from the design, architecture and construction process. They help you mitigate risk, eliminate surprises, save time, save money and reduce your efforts. Sounds great. Check out their amazing work and have access to their square footage calculator to help you plan out your expansion or new build. Click the link in the show notes for the exclusive offer and learn more about Apex Design Build. Why do banks seem to always be impersonal, slow to answer questions, or give you the runaround when you need money for your dreams? Enter Panacea Financial. Panacea Financial is a nationwide digital bank built for doctors by doctors. Whether you're a veterinarian in training, practice owner, or aspire to be a practice owner someday, Panacea Financial is a bank designed specifically for you. It was started by two doctors who were frustrated working with banks and so started their own to serve their community. With common sense lending guidelines and fast, fast decisioning, they've helped doctors all across the country start, grow, or acquire their dream practice. Looking to buy into a practice, Panacea helps doctors with practice buy-in loans, and they are funded in a matter of days. If you're ready to join thousands of doctors nationwide who have decided to get independence from traditional banks, visit panaceafinancial.com today to see how you can get your dream practice started. Panacea Financial is a division of Premise member FDIC. Finding a job or finding a veterinarian shouldn't be a waste of time. Enter an offer first. Paul Diaz and team have created something really special with offer first. Some of my favorite reasons are as follows. Candidates and employers will both have values aligned on the first step, not the last. The sign-up process, quick and simple, no resume required. So if you're looking for a job, but you aren't really sure, it's as easy as scrolling on Zillow for a home. And finally, if you have a great match, it's based on your each unique requirements, not random keywords. If you want to learn more, listen to episode 170, 
nine with Paul Diaz. We cover all of that. Uh, the other exclusive great thing that you're going to get from this ad read and from Paul is I convinced him to give an exclusive discount to listeners of this podcast. So for owners, you're getting a 20% discount on both the um, placement of any candidate, but also access to the platform. Use VSP if you go to offer first or the easiest way is a link in the show notes. So check it out. Associates, those looking for a job, um, same thing. Use the link in the show notes. Use VSP if you go directly to offer first. But I will donate and Paul will donate to a veterinary nonprofit of your choosing. So each person that signs up gets a vote. Your votes actually count, which is incredible. And so I'll be reaching out. I will handle that. But there's going to be a donation made for any associate or any job seeker that adds on the platform. We want to make sure that not only does the platform help to make sure that you find a better fit, better culture, better role, but it's also doing good in veterinary medicine. Okay, so link in the show notes is going to take you to offer first. It's going to automatically apply that, but also use code VSP if you go to offer first directly. And offer first is changing the game of veterinary recruiting. I want each and every one of you to benefit from it. So check them out today. All right. So there are a lot of great job postings that I want to get to. And so we're going to start off with Bayside Hospital for Animals. Great work-life balance in beautiful Fort Walton Beach, Florida. No weekends, Monday to Friday, eight to five, no on-call or emergencies. It's an appointment only here. Currently a two and a half doctor practice, new owner in 2021, bringing some fresh life into the hospital. Um, the new owner had been there for six years prior working, so definitely understands the team, the processes in the community. Lots of investment in people and new equipment. ProSal is the pay structure. Far too many benefits for me to list. Email BaysideVet251 at Yahoo or call 850-864-1857. Join a thriving, growing small animal practice in Vermont on the Quebec border. Full-time ideal, part-time is considered. The idea is to start with yes with the team, patients and clients in outdoorsmen or outdoor woman's paradise while uh, being able to practice high-quality medicine. Compensation is write your own structure within production capabilities. Literally, it is the owner wants to find the right person and is happy to negotiate, chat through, and find the right fit. If you want autonomy and a boss that enjoys teaching, reach out to Newport Veterinary Hospital. You can email newportveterinaryhospital at gmail.com. Uh, North Central Indiana, looking for an oasis in the chaos. You know, who is it, right? Come join the amazing team at Fulton County Veterinary Clinic. They strive to foster a fun, fast-paced work environment while providing quality patient care. They utilize the support staff efficiently so that the doctor is available to practice medicine and do what you're trained to do in less time and paperwork, which is great. Lots of investment in new equipment and technology to support you full-time or part-time available. Small animal and exotics are both seen there. So no ER, no on-call, no weekends, competitive salary with sign-on bonus offered and far too many benefits to list. Um, go to Fulton County Veterinary Clinic. So type that in and you'll find the job posting there. Last but not least, join Watertown Animal Hospital. Personal, personable, small animal veterinarian wanted for well-established current five doctor mixed animal practice in Northern New York, which is an outdoors person's paradise. Again, two of those. So if you like the outdoors, you can look at Vermont or New York. We They have plenty of support staff with six uh, CSRs, six licensed technicians, four animal caretakers, two technical assistants, a hospital associate, or sorry, hospital assistant, a practice manager, and a bookkeeper. Focuses on mentorship and investment um, on the people and the technology. Um, that's been a strategic initiative by the leadership team. No on call, a uh, 24 hour ER less than an hour away. Salary based on experience, but no less than 95,000. Can be straight salary, pro sal considered. Want to discuss that with the right person. Uh, tons of benefits. Again, too much to list. Please reach out to watertownpetcare.com for that option as well. So, again, if you find a role or a job or talk to anyone and it helps you in any way, I would love to hear that feedback. So, please reach out. Let me know what. Um, you're able to do. And I will continue to post these. So if you are an owner, reach out to me, let me know. And uh, we'll go from there. And until I hit a capacity of I can't keep recording these, I want to let people know um, who are high quality owners around the country looking for great help. So with that, uh, we'll talk soon. Thanks for listening to today's show. The comments made on today's show should not be taken as investment, tax, or legal advice. All comments are for educational purposes only. You should talk to your professional team before implementing anything.
If you want or need financial advice, my day job on Not Podcasting is helping veterinarians grow their net worth. Our team is taking new clients and we are ready to talk to you at any stage of life. Come as you are. I always say bring the mess, right? Like if things are unorganized, that's okay. There's no prerequisites to become a client. Isaiah Douglas is a partner at Vincere Wealth Management. Isaiah is a registered investment advisor registered with the SEC. The biggest compliment you can give me in the podcast is to share it with a friend. Reviews help the show get found and Apple Podcast is the platform that is predominantly used for people listening to the show. If you have three minutes, love the show, head over to Apple Podcasts, give us an honest rating and review. It helps more people find the show. Also, the new YouTube channel is up and I'd love to have you subscribe. Vainly, I want 100 subscribers at least. Lots more, obviously, right? But I get a vanity URL if we get to 100. That would be great. It makes it easier to find the YouTube channel as well. For all of today's links information, head over to the veterinariansuccesspodcast.com. There you can subscribe to your favorite podcasting platform. It'll be a link to that YouTube channel I just talked about. You won't miss any other episodes, whether you listen on Spotify, whether you have some other ancillary podcast platform please like, subscribe, all that stuff. It certainly does help. I appreciate it. Finally, if you want more information, insights, want your voice to be heard, want to share ideas for content, say, hey, Isaiah, I want you to have this guest. I want you to talk about this topic. Go over to the Facebook group. So you can search for the Veterinary Success Podcast on Facebook or head over to veterinariansuccesspodcast.com. Scroll to the bottom about your host, click on the Facebook icon, and that'll get you in the group. But thank you so much for listening. It means a lot to me to be able to see the podcast grow and continue to impact people. So with that, until next time, we'll chat soon.